So by now, we all have a healthy respect for Lagrange's theorem. That theorem that says that in a finite group, the order of any subgroup is a divisor of the order of the whole group. That is such a useful fact, and we use it all over the place. The problem with Lagrange's theorem is that its converse is not in general true. In other words, if you give me a divisor of the order of a big group, I cannot necessarily provide you with an element or with a subgroup that realizes that order. For example, just because I know that a group has order 120 does not guarantee for me that that group has an element of order 12 or a subgroup of order 10 or a subgroup of order 60. Right? We don't know that it works that way, and in general, it doesn't. The good news is that in some cases, it does. Sometimes the converse to Lagrange's theorem is also a true statement. But in order for that converse to be guaranteed to be true, we need some additional assumptions on our group. And in this video, we'll see probably one of the most valuable uh, assumptions that we can attach um, that lets us get a partial converse to Lagrange's theorem. And this converse is so important that it gets its name of its own as well. This converse is called Cauchy's theorem. So just to set the stage, remember what Lagrange's theorem says. Lagrange's theorem says that if I have a subgroup H of a finite group G, then its order is a divisor of the order of the big group. And that converse that says that if you give me a divisor of the order of G, I can provide for you a subgroup whose order is that divisor, that converse is untrue in general. But what Cauchy's theorem does is it adds a couple of key assumptions. The first assumption that it adds is that our group, our full group G, is an abelian group. That's a pretty heavy-handed assumption, uh, but it turns out it'll be necessary to get the converse that we're looking at in this video. And the second assumption is that that divisor that we're looking at is a prime divisor. So Cauchy's theorem will say, if G is a finite abelian group whose order is n, and if I choose a prime divisor, a prime factor of n, then we will be able to conclude that there exists not just a subgroup of order p, but in fact an element whose order is p. After all, those two things are going to go hand in hand, because as soon as I have a subgroup of order p, that will be isomorphic to a group of order p. We know every group of prime order is already cyclic, and therefore we get a generator whose order is equal to the order of that subgroup. So these two things go hand in hand, and depending on our context, we might find the element's existence to be more valuable, or the subgroup's existence to be more valuable. But regardless, Cauchy's theorem guarantees us this partial converse to the Lagrange theorem, that every prime divisor of the order of a finite abelian group has an element whose order is that prime. So what's it going to take for us to prove this statement? So let's start off by just letting P be an arbitrary prime divisor of the order of our group N. I'm going to outline how I want to prove this. The first thing I want to prove is I want to prove that G for sure has at least some element of prime order. In other words, we can't have any group that's made up of elements all of whose orders are composite. We have to have a prime order element. And then once I've established that G has a prime order element, then I need to show that that prime is actually able to be chosen up front arbitrarily, right? That that prime can actually be P. There must exist an element of order this P, not just some P, but the P that was arbitrarily chosen for us at the beginning of this proof. And to accomplish that, I'm going to use an argument using the strong principle of mathematical induction which means we need to establish a base case. I'm going to induct on the order of our group n, and then also on the prime p that we're choosing as the divisor. So my base case is going to be when my group has order 2. If I try starting with 1, I'm going to get a faulty induction. And then I'm going to make a strong induction hypothesis. I'm going to assume that this theorem is true for all groups whose order is less than n. And then in the inductive step, try to deduce from that assumption that the statement is true for groups of order equal to n. So that's the roadmap for the proof. So here's my group G. It's got an identity element E. Let's prove first that some element of prime order must exist. So let's assume that this is a non-trivial group, and so I can select a non-trivial element X. Then what do I know about X? Well, if it's non-trivial, that means the order of X is bigger than 1. I'm going to call that order R. So the Rth power of X takes me to the identity. Well, so if R is bigger than 1, then R has a prime factorization that's not trivial. So there's some prime, let's call it Q, that is a divisor of R. So we'll write R is equal to Q times S, where Q is a prime. And what that does is it breaks this trip from X to the identity, which happens in the Rth power, it breaks it into two steps. 
if r is equal to q times s, then I can also take the rth power of x by taking the qth power of the sth power, or I suppose vice versa. If I take the sth power first and then the qth power second, what that shows me is that s x to the power s times q is equal to the identity, but that just grouping the x to the s by itself, I have an element x to the power s whose qth power is equal to the identity. And therefore, we know that the order of x to the power s, the order of this element, because its qth power is the identity, its order is a divisor of q. But q is a prime, and therefore it only has two possible divisors, itself and one. If the order of x to the power s were equal to one, then that would mean x to the power s is the identity. But x to the power s can't be the identity because we already assumed that the order of x was equal to r and s is less than r. So no smaller power of r can be equal to the identity. That gives us a contradiction. So we can't have the sth power be equal to the identity. And so this order cannot be equal to 1. Therefore, it must be equal to q, as we wanted. So this proves that every finite abelian group, in fact, you'll notice we didn't use the abelian hypothesis at all, every finite group, according to this proof, has some element whose order is prime. The problem for us is that we don't know that that prime q is the same thing as the prime p which we're working with in this proof. So that's what we need to uh, establish in the conclusion here. So I'll set up a strong induction argument. I want to first assume that this theorem is true for all groups that are smaller than mine, and then use an induction to show that it must therefore also be true for my group. The base case will be when the order of this group is equal to 2. So if the order of g is 2, then p is going to be a prime, arbitrary prime, that divides 2. Well, there's only one of those, 2. So does my group of order 2 have an element of order 2 in it? Of course, because there's only one group of order 2 up to isomorphism. Uh, it's the identity element and then the one non-trivial element. And that one non-trivial element must already have order 2. We already know that. So the base case we can dispatch with very quickly. Now we make our induction hypothesis. We're going to assume that every group that's smaller than mine has a, a prime order element for any prime that divides its order that we can choose. Now we want to establish the induction step. Why does my group have an element of order p? So we'll first start by invoking this first statement that we proved. We proved that my group has to have an element whose order is some prime. Okay. And I'm going to call that prime q. So let's let a be a prime order element in my group. And let's call the order of a q. We're going to assume that q and p are different. Because if q is already equal to my prime, then we're already done. And therefore, a is my element of order p. So if q is not equal to p, we've got some more work to do. So we'll make that assumption. q is not equal to p. So over here, I have an element a whose qth power is the identity. All right, so how am I going to proceed from here? Let's think about what the cyclic subgroup generated by a is going to look like. That cyclic subgroup, let's call it k, is going to have q elements in it. Because after all, q is the order of my element a. So A is going to generate this cyclic subgroup of order Q. Because my group is abelian, that cyclic subgroup is a normal subgroup. Remember, every subgroup of an abelian group is automatically a normal subgroup. And that's valuable because it lets us form the quotient group, the factor group, of G by K. G mod K is going to be a group because left cosets and the right cosets are going to agree because K is a normal subgroup because G was an abelian group. So we can actually talk about g mod k as a group in its own right. So what is the order of the group g mod k? So the picture that I always use here sort of indicates where we get it from. The order of the whole group g is n. On the other hand, the order of k is q. That's how many columns I have in this chart. And therefore, the order of g mod k, the number of cosets of k and g, is just going to be the quotient, the order of g divided by the number of columns, which is q, which is the order of k. And so the order of this factor group is just n divided by q. But since q is a prime, that means it's greater than or equal to 2, that means that n divided by q is strictly less than n. And now you see why this construction is valuable. Because we've just constructed a group, g mod k, that on the one hand is an abelian group, because g was abelian, and every factor group of an abelian group is also abelian. So it's an abelian group, but its order, n divided by q, is less than n. So our strong induction hypothesis, we want to apply to g mod k. And we're going to be able to apply that hypothesis to g mod k 
and our prime p because p and q were assumed to be distinct primes and they both are divisors of n and therefore once I divide n by q p is still going to be a divisor of that quotient because p and q were distinct primes so all in all g mod k is an abelian group whose order is less than n and of which p is still a divisor Therefore, a strong induction hypothesis can be applied to G mod K to conclude that there exists an element of G mod K, I'm going to call it GK. That element has order P, where P is the same prime that we chose at the beginning of our proof. And so that key use of the induction hypothesis is going to get us to where we need to go. Now we have an element of order P in our picture. The problem is it's an element of the factor group and not an element of the group G. So to get to where we're going, we have to lift that order P element out of the factor group and back to the full group itself. How do we do that? Well, so GK, having order P in the factor group, means that the Pth power of GK is equal to the identity element of the factor group, which we can think of as EK, or just K, if you like, right? But based on how we do arithmetic with cosets, the Pth power of J, GK is the same as g to the p k. That's, after all, how we multiply cosets together in a factor group. But what this means is that g to the power p is in the same coset of k as the identity element is. So this identity coset k is the same as g to the p k. So when I lift g back to the original group, I can lift g to the p back to the original group, and g to the p is going to land in my cyclic subgroup. So g is some element in my group g, such that when I take the pth power, it lands back in my original coset. The question now is, when I take the pth power of g, do I land at the identity element in k, or do I land at some other element in k? We need to have a plan to cover both of those possibilities. In the first case, if the pth power of g does happen to land directly on the identity element, then we know for sure that g is an element of order p. After all, g is not equal to the identity because it came from a different coset uh, than the identity element did, and its pth power is equal to the identity. Since p is a prime, we can therefore deduce that the order of g is equal to p. So if we happen to get lucky and g to the power p was the identity, then we're done. g is my element of order p in my group. But what if we didn't get lucky? What if the pth power of g is not equal to the identity? What can we then conclude? Well, whatever the pth power of G is, it is an element of the cyclic subgroup generated by A, which has order Q. Therefore, every element of this subgroup is going to have an order that divides the order of the subgroup. But the order of the subgroup, Q, is a prime. Therefore, the order of G to the power P has to be a divisor of Q. But if G to the power P is not the identity itself, its order cannot be 1. And therefore, the order of G to the P must be Q. So g to the p to the power q has got to equal the identity. So the qth power of g to the p has to get me to the identity. Okay, but that just shows that we have an element of order q. We already knew that. Where do we get our element of order p from? Well, the qth power of g to the p is the same thing by the commutative property of multiplication and by properties of exponents as the pth power of g to the q. So if I instead take the qth power first and the pth power second, I'm still guaranteed to get back to the identity. But what that shows me is that g to the power q has an order which divides p. But since p is a prime, if g to the power q is not the identity, that means g to the power q has to be an element of order p. And so regardless of where in k my g to the power p happened to land, we've now shown that my group capital G has an element of order p. It's either this g or it's the qth power of that g. And that concludes our proof. So every finite abelian group, if you give me a divisor of its order, which is a prime divisor, then we know for sure that group is going to have an element whose order is equal to that prime. For example, any finite abelian group of order 2555 will definitely have an element of order 5 in it because 5 is a prime divisor of 2555. The last thing I want to point out before we close 
is how important to our proof this hypothesis of the group being abelian was. If my group were not abelian, I would not have been guaranteed that the cyclic subgroup generated by A is a normal subgroup. And if it weren't a normal subgroup, I wouldn't be able to form this factor group. I wouldn't be able to have the nice arithmetic that allowed me to make all of these conclusions here at the end. So the abelianness was crucial to our proof. It turns out, though, that the abelianness is not crucial to the truth of Cauchy's theorem. Cauchy's theorem remains true even if we get rid of the abelian hypothesis. So every finite group, if you give me a prime divisor of its order, there will exist an element whose order is equal to that prime. The problem is the proof of the more general case is much more involved and it requires a, a bit more theory than we've been able to develop in our course so far. But if you're interested in it, um, a more advanced course uh, in first semester group theory will go into the theorems called the Seeloff theorems. And the Seeloff theorems are where we learn more of the theoretical underpinnings that show us why a theorem like Cauchy's theorem is actually true for all finite groups and not just for finite abelian groups. But the proof is a little bit more involved. I encourage you to look at it uh, if you're interested.